We are now recording, so everyone should be on their best behavior. Um, I want to welcome everyone uh, to the November Houston Functional Programming Group. Um, today we have uh, Jeff Olson speaking. Well, he said he was speaking on functional programming in Rust, but apparently that was a lie, um, according to his title. Um, so I'm uh, very excited to welcome him. Uh, Rust is becoming increasingly popular. Um, I wanna mention next month uh, it, for December, we traditionally do not have a talk. We have a social hour. So that will be set up on Zoom uh, yet again uh, for this year. And then starting in January, uh, we can all talk about it if, if we're ready to start going back in hybrid mode or something like that. Um, I am looking for speakers for next year. So I'll be reaching out to a bunch of you if you have uh, talks, topics that you want to cover, um, please let me know. I think that's all the sort of business that I have. So I want to introduce um, Jeff Olson and I don't know. He can introduce himself, actually. So go for it, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Claude. Um, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Jeff Olson. I'm a senior solutions designer uh, at Insperity, um, which, if you don't know, it's a Fortune 1000 company in the uh, HR and co-employment space uh, based in Kingwood, Texas. Um, this talk is titled Functional Programming in Rust, uh, parenthetically, a misnamed presentation. I think the reason for that will become obvious um, as this wears on because I think just because of space and time constraints, um, I, I spent more time probably just unpacking kind of basic things about the language and that ends up kind of, you know, cutting into the time for, I mean, and really like the stuff that's, I mean, yeah, it's we, we don't have the time to give like a workshop on, you know, basically functional patterns and practices and kind of, you know, how you would fit them in um, that I would want to do something a lot more hands on. So really, I can what I can do, though, is kind of present a uh, specific framing of functional programming, um, you know, based on certain frames of reference, mostly for, you know, Haskell and OCaml programmers, and then pivot that and, con and contrast it with Rust and where things are uh, strong and where things, you know, will be able to be improved with time and where they're still pretty rough. Um, forgive me if I sound under the weather, I'm, I'm bouncing back from a recent illness. So uh, it's, it's not because I'm not enthusiastic. I promise you I am overflowing with enthusiasm. I just feel like hot garbage. Um, so, so let me jo jump in very, very quickly. Uh, so if you're sort of parceling out um, the functional programming aspect. One of the reasons that I was really excited um, about uh, you coming in and, and presenting on Rust is because I know almost nothing about Rust. But okay. what I do know is that it, sir, it, it seems, my understanding is it comes from the ML line. When you were saying Haskell and OCaml, mm -hmm. also standard ML, like it, it, it's sort of like the imperative cousin of those. And it, it includes a lot of that. So I see you sort of shaking your head, but, but that was one of the things that like mm. has been interesting to me about this. Yeah, so what, what I would say is, I mean, and I'll get into it in, in, the, in the talk, um, like syntax wise, there's a lot of the things that I would call kind of modern conveniences from the ML line. Um, and like I said, I, I don't want to give away the whole, the whole talk before I've even jumped into my slides because then I'll really be in trouble. Um, but uh, suffice to say, um, yeah, no, I, I, I um, it's, it's hard. I, I think with experience, it's hard to say that it really like it comes from the ML line. But in the end, there's a lot of there's a lot of like I'd call like critical betrayals of, you know, functional paradigms that you'll see kind of played out. And those are because of the, you know, on on certain places where you have to pick one or the other. Rust comes down on a certain side again and again and again. And that'll become obvious as this talk goes on. So without um, let me let me just jump into that. Um, so I guess, like I said, I'm here today to talk about, you know, Rust programming language, in particular, uh, functional programming in Rust, although, you know, to be honest, that isn't the majority of the presentation, and I hope I'll still get some key uh, ideas across, uh, if not, um, if I, I will settle for not criminally misinforming you. Um, and, you know, talking about Rust itself, I gathered, you know, based on things I've heard before, that there's a lot of buzz in this community. Um, 
And uh, I hope that what I have to share is useful. Uh, I also, before I started, want to uh, give a, a thanks to David Lewis for extending the invitation to me um, to appear before all of you. So I, I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity. This is probably, I mean, like a lot of you, you know, I've kind of stopped engaging with the public community for a while. And so, you know, and getting out and doing talks and stuff. So it was good to get back in the saddle. And I jumped at the opportunity when it was offered. So uh, without further ado, um, in terms of the things that I'd like to cover overall in this talk, um, first, of course, I want to introduce the project, uh, its history and context, which I hope will kind of clear up a lot of the uh, questions that I, I made about kind of, you know, where when, when there's these two kind of options where Russ comes down on one side, I hope that I can, I can kind of clarify some of that to give you an idea of what I mean. Um, and in particular, some of the persistent pain points that organizations like Mozilla uh, had to contend with in their code bases and why it led to uh, the creation of Rust. Um, expanding upon you know, Rust's extant context, I want to talk about some of the key trade-offs that Rust makes and where it comes down on a number of issues um, while actually introducing you to the Rust code and syntax project layout, basic tooling, et cetera. Um, also, for any of you who are actually already familiar with Rust, like if you're expecting to show up and you know shoot the breeze um, and, and, and you know talk about a bunch of advanced Rust stuff, uh, you know that Rust is a huge language. Um, and so I really can't even cover like really even 40% of the language's actual features. I can kind of talk about what I think are kind of the most basis, basic structural things on top of which we can build enough knowledge to talk about the functional topics that I want to cover in this talk. And that was kind of what I was going for. Um, and if there's stuff that I miss or if there's topics that I introduce kind of out of nowhere, then that's my bad. Just stop and let me know and I'll do my best to expand upon that. Uh, my goal, of course, is to give you guys something useful that you can take away from this. Um, of course, you know, like I said, the promised thing in the title, a discussion of functional programming in Rust itself. I wanted to highlight it because it's actually, it's funny, it's actually just one part of the talk and there's a bunch of other stuff, you know, th that ends up kind of coming up and, and overruling that. Um, I want to uh, also talk about, um, you know, in context for Rust, uh, I want to present some entry points for different kinds of programming where Rust is popular um, for anybody, you know, who wants to do certain kinds of things, whether it's game dev or embedded programming, um, you know, just kind of to provide some pointers for where you can go to find out more information. Um, there's a couple of things I think that are really exciting uh, about the future um, of, of, you know, stable Rust, I should say, because there's all kinds of wild stuff in the nightly builds, uh, but much of it never makes it out. Um, or will stay in the nightly builds forever, um, just because of the nature of it. So that some of the things that are making it into, you know, that the stable main branches are, are is going to be really cool. So I'm excited about that. Um, the first, I, I want to just really, really quickly kind of talk about Rust in brief. Um, Rust is multi-paradigm, which is to say it accommodates a more object-oriented style where data-bearing structures manage their internal state via methods. Um, you know, the way that we have kind of a concept of structures holding data matched forward to methods or, you know, um, doing certain kinds of like inheritance-based polymorphism is through what's called a trait system, which if you're familiar with Haskell is basically like Haskell type classes where you specify a trait and then you have to implement that trait. You implement, it kind of ends up being like a three-way pivot between the specification of the trait and then implement a concrete implementation of the trait for a, you know, a data structure and where you actually will spell out methods and then you know you can have default methods and so on that are already defined. Um, you know, those are, are features that you're seeing that are leaking back up into like, you know, .NET Core or, um, with the default implementations on interfaces. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Um, as well as within Rust accommodates more functional styles, you know, that focus on things like uh, immutability, declarative patterns, and uh, purity um, in design. Um, the classic description um, of the project, of course, is that it pursues the trifecta of safety. I would say in safety in terms of memory access, that's a really important caveat um, that really needs to be emphasize, emphasized. Performance, in this case, chasing a C++-like performance profile and benchmarks, which I think the project has been pretty good about doing, and concurrency. Um, which, but which I would point out is subordinate to safety. As anybody who's done any amount of multi-threaded programming in Rust will tell you, um, the compiler will get on you pretty quick uh, because it is a uh, is a harsh taskmaster. Um, 
Rust has a broadly C-like syntax with some conveniences, like the fact that many of the control flow structures, like if else, are expression style. So you can use them like you would in like OCaml or in an ML language where you can use ifs basically to you know do conditional values where things that you would do in, in like C with the ternary expressions. So you have um, but you know, just more the idea that like um, you know, like that that all blocks blocks naturally become expression based so you have things like return position becomes important and you know things that like you don't really think about if you're programming in a c like language um but that languages like even like you know scala f sharp um and stuff like that that kind of like you know even if you're doing a more imperative style things that fall out uh, pretty naturally um a um a Sorry, just a sec. Um, there are also other nuances of the language. Uh, it has an LLK grammar. So some in, some things that fall out of that is that parentheses are optional in um, like control flow structures, like around ifs, so you don't have to use parentheses, but brackets always end up being uh, required for all blocks, um, except for like single expression uh, closures or, you know, like in inline specified, um, you know, functions. Um, and so, you know, because there's always, you know, because there's always blocks for control flow structures, and you don't have things like sentinel clauses or accidental fall through. Uh, there's no case structures. Um, another OCaml influence worth noting is the uh, compiler's default allowance of shadowing variables, which is, you know, redecla redeclaring the same variable over and over, even though it has a different backing type as, you know, it gets consumed and used. Um, that's something that you know, it's, it seems to be like a more functional style. And, and it becomes pretty useful in Rust when you're dealing with linear types that, you know, you basically consume and, and excrete new values over and over. Uh, Rust is statically typed uh, with a rich type system that's most often compared to Haskell, but it's worth noting that it includes a few features mostly because of the borrowing and like value moving systems um, that really like, only can you match or surpass when you get into dependently typed systems like Coke or Agda. Um, and so, you know, but that being said, of course, Haskell has, you know, out of the box, like higher kinded types, um, you know, that are expressible in the language right now. Rust is coming about with a way to have the same level of expression, but they're approaching it from a different angle, I would say, because, I mean, if you look at HKT, you understand that it requires basically runtime, like there's a lot of runtime stuff happening under the covers. And so with Rust, you don't necessarily have that. Um, a major goal of Rust has also been to expose uh, what's commonly called a C-like memory model, which is usually shorthand for something much closer to how a processor actually works, although you don't you know, get access to registers and stuff. Um, this is most important when you compare Rust against more pure functional languages who by their very design kind of require pervasive uses of things like linked list and hidden heap allocations under the covers and garbage collection um, to kind of abstract away and, and you know give you like a more pure environment to work in. Um, the goal for Rust is to not compromise on any uh, memory access functionality offered by C and C++. And, you know, because Rust also includes a robust foreign function interface for consuming and exposing Rust code to C and C++, um, you know, like those things being hard constraints, ultimately those are things that kind of chew away at a lot of, um, you know, like the functional conveniences that you see in other more pure languages. Um, in line with above, uh, you know, like the focus on, zero, you know, performance um, and, you know, transparent memory access, uh, Rust focuses and you end up seeing it kind of borne out in a lot of uh, the standard library types and of course uh, library types produced by vendors um, is the focus on zero cost abstractions and a lot of uh, RIAA, I mean like resource acquisition is initialization style patterns that arise as a result. So, you know, if you're familiar with you know, particularly in like C++, um, Rust has got you there and it's still there. Uh, Rust also boasts, I would say, what I think is the most robust developer tool chain out there. Um, and perhaps if there are any dedicated Haskell or you know OCaml or Go or no developers who, who feel otherwise, then I'm sorry. Uh, reasonable minds can disagree on this, I hope. So don't flame me too hard. Um, moving on to talking about Rust, the project itself. Uh, it started out initially as a, uh, a project of a gentleman named Graydon Hoare, um, a Canadian developer who I believe he did undergrad in math and then a master's in uh, CS before moving on to industry work. Uh, most of his 
work and his CV is around kind of compilers and what he calls industrial C++, so kind of working on like high performance, uh, high, availability, high, availability, uh, high availability systems that because of implementation needs need to move down, lower down the stack and away from, you know, virtual runtime environments. Um, so that was kind of his experience. And then he ended up landing at uh, Mozilla, um, where, you know, the, uh, a major issue for them is basically their, you know, at this, at that point, I mean, 15 years old, give or take, depending on how you track the age of a Mozilla going back to, you know, its various incarnations, um, you know, an old, very mature, very large C, C++ code base and them dealing with, uh, you know, basically memory um, related issues. And, you know, as that being a major source of bugs and vulnerabilities and um, for them. And so, for him, the motivation to make Rust would be summed up, I guess, like so, and this is paraphrasing a 2019 Twitter exchange that he had. Um, he said he saw Rust as, and I quote, like throwing C++ folks, including myself, a life raft with regard to safety. Safety is the thing. The C++, we want to hit the C++ niche, but we want memory safe and including, including race for three multi, uh, race free multi threading. And that's hard. Um, and so, building kind of working on you know that project he started with uh is if the original rust uh, compiler was done in ocaml um and while he was working on it at mozilla they began sponsoring the project and they helped put together a team of researchers um particularly a gentleman named uh, nico matsasis who um, made what i would say are some pretty critical contributions that i'll get into a little bit later um eventually the you know with that you know, with the team together, the core compiler was rewritten and became self-hosting, uh, you know, before the project was announced in uh, 2010. Um, and then between 2010 and its 1.0 release, they iterated on a lot of features, including adding the, like the borrowing system didn't exist at the time of the first alpha release. And the way that they were basically dealing with memory safety was kind of with like annotations that separated heap allocated from like locally in thread reference counted things from pure value types. Um, and they eventually iterated towards a system that ended up being more like C and C++, but had, you know, the borrowing system included, which itself is kind of an extension of a cyclone, if you're familiar with that, which was um, a C dialect, a kind of experimental research C dialect that had uh, some early versions of what, you know, would become the borrowing, what, you know, becomes the borrowing system in Rust. Um, so, like I said, um, you know, the including the borrowing system, um, just making changes to the language to hew even closer to a true C++ memory and runtime model. Um, the early version of the language actually had like a, a, a checked constraint or contracts feature, like where you could put constraints on functions that was removed. Um, you know, like I said, tool, you know, retooling of syntax, um, references, boxes, which are, you know, Rust is Rust basically library type for dealing with heap, heap values or, you know, memory allocated on the heap. Um, and then, of course, the introduction of mutability kind of as a core concept for when you like at the time of specifying a slot or a variable, specifying mutability and kind of the things that fall out from that. Um, all of that was done before reaching 1.0 in uh, 2015. And since the 1.0 release, changes to Rust have been uh, organized into three rolling offerings. There's a nightly version of Rust that's built and released, of course, nightly uh, based on the state, uh, the passing state of the trunk um, of the Git repository, you know, so if the main trunk is passing, then, you know, they'll, re they'll release. Um, they have a roll rolling beta release that base, I believe it is updated every six weeks and things that quote unquote graduate out of the nightly, they go into the beta release um, and then they're there and they'll stay there for a while. And then finally, there's a stable release that contains features graduating out of the beta on a rolling consistent six week basis. Uh, the latest re release is one is Rust 1.56.1. This is a point release on the 1.56.0 uh, to address a code formatting CVE. Um, if you're, it, it's not like a, it's actually a really interesting vulnerability. Um, and if you go read the the 1.56.1 announcement, it points at them. Uh, basically, they they introduced with 1.56.0. Um, allowing you to use like arbitrary Unicode for identifiers, which wasn't a thing before. And so when you have um, 
arbitrary Unicode and identifiers, there's ways to sneak in like basically empty identifiers that would mess up the code formatting uh, based on whether it was right to left or left to right. And so you could get this situation where somebody could maliciously basically pollute uh, the identifier spaces so that um, basically code when you looked at it as a raw file versus when it was actually compiled um, like that it would actually look different in different situations and so they have a uh, they, they did a release to address that um, and then finally rust also periodically releases additions that represent ba uh, basically breaking changes compared to previous editions so when rust 1.0 was released rust 2015 was the edition that was released at that time um, regardless of the version all prior editions will be supported in the compiler and individual crates opt into which edition they support uh, the latest Rust edition is 2021, which, like I said, um, or and if I had mentioned it, it actually uh, was debuted at the same time as the most recent Rust release, 1.56, which was at the uh, in in late October. Um, as noted before, um, of course, Rust is an open source uh, project and it's developed out in the open on GitHub. Um, they developed a lot of really amazing build infrastructure and I'd say that um, it's, it's a huge part of their project expenses, uh, just running their build infrastructure considering the amount of stuff they're doing. Um, and just talking about contributing to Rust, uh, it could be its own discussion. So if that's something you're interested in or learning more about the project structure and kind of you know what all is there and how you can get involved, I just recommend checking out Rust, uh, rustlang.org um, to learn more. Um, of course, uh, Rust was originally owned as a project within Mozilla, um, but has since been spun out um, and is now governed by an independent nonprofit that manages trademarks and copyrights and provides a funding structure for sponsors. Um, I also read after I, I made this uh, slide, actually, that a new batch of sponsors just joined this month, um, including Arm and Toyota or others. I don't know. Are there any are there any Misra, Misra C programmers here? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Any good stuff? Any, any embedded folks tonight? No? Okay. Yeah. So it's interesting that an auto manufacturer is coming on because what they have right now for the state of the art for auto programming is pretty, pretty gnarly. Um, if you're curious, like I said, look up, look up Misra C, M-I-S-R-A. Um, and so uh, since before the uh, 1.0 release, the Rust team has been doing most of their feature development out in the open through a public RFC process where the community members suggest features kind of as an in, an, in a standardized essay format. And they have a place to kind of discuss and, and debate about that. And then also, you know, the, the RFCs themselves kind of become tagged and numbered so that they can be referenced explicitly in a subsequent pull request. Uh, the Rust government governance structure um, features a core team that oversees the directions of the project and then sub-team leadership um, leadership of sub teams and then cross cutting concerns uh, sub teams cover everything from the compiler infrastructure language features uh, crate io management crates io is the uh, website for kind of the backing package system for rust um, i won't have a lot of time to get into the developer tooling but you know bears mentioning that rust ships an official supported package repository akin to npm um, but with many features that are more appropriate to the fact that it's shipping native code um, and a lot of you know like dealing with different platforms and so on um, and of course like i said dev tooling community moderation releases etc um, so for next, I want to dive into talking about the key trade-offs of Rust, but first, let's actually show some code. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go and uh, actually just use the Rust tooling. Everybody can see my, that's not too small, is it, my PowerShell window? So I'm going to go ahead. It, it, it's pretty small. Okay. <laughs> so... What I'm doing here is, um, is that a little better? Yeah. Okay, what I'm doing here is really quickly just spinning up a new, uh, you need to chip in it by claw to make your screen. <laughs> well, that, that is true. <laughs> that is true. So really, just really, I use Cargo, which is um, Rust basically package and project management tool to uh, initialize a new project. And so what it did was it spun up this library and also it made it a valid Git repository. 
Um, so that's here and it's in place for us. And then I just opened a, a Visual Studio window. Um, first class Rust tooling is available in VS Code. If you want to um, do that, I would just install it. Recommend just getting the Rust extension. Um, so what we get here is, of course, like I said, this is a Git repository. So they give us kind of a, a Git style, um, you know, Git ignore. And then the, this TOML file is basically the manifest. Um, if you're familiar with, you know, NPM or, you know, app applications or package routes, this is equivalent to, you know, the package JSON. Um, and so you can specify a lot of the same stuff, although it has a lot more um, stuff that is, you know, germane just to Rust. Uh, but in the actual source itself, we actually have the library. And so what they gave us here was just this little, um, actually just a bit of test code. So really quickly, what we have here is this is a um, basically a compiler directive that says to only compile this code when we're compiling for tests. And so the compiler will know whether it's compiling for a build, debug, production, or, you know, test. And it, it, it does basically, you know, that affects the size of the binary. Uh, by convention, Rust, um, they don't have separate libraries or even separate files. Usually the tests are in line as freestanding functions uh, alongside where actual implementation is. That's just kind of by convention. That's the way that, you know, they've done it. Um, so really quick though, I just want to go ahead and um, make, a, make a function that does a thing. And uh, go ahead and uh, then, oh, whoops. Excuse me. And use it. Um, so here, just really here, really quick within this function, uh, we can go. We can see. I can do once again. I can use the cargo tooling, and it'll go ahead and it runs this one out of the box test. So. I want to go ahead and just use this, and I want to go. And I want to run it. Oh, whoops, I did not save. Whoa, what's this about? It's complaining. It says it can't find this function in scope. What's that about? Well, it turns out that what I need to do, um, in order to make use of this, is I actually have to import this thing in. And so in order to get that to work. So that kind of brings us to the first lesson of Rust, which is that um, Rust really favors explosion over succinctness. Uh, that is, the Rust compiler will almost always push you towards explicitly spelling out your act, uh, expectations. It does; it assumes very little, um, and most of the stuff where it does assumptions is for convenience around managing references and values. Um, but for every, almost everything else, um, they you know the compiler will make you pay if you uh, if you don't spell it all out. Uh, and I'd say, you know, as part of that, Rust already has a reputation, um, rightly earned, for having a really uh, dense syntax with a lot of gotchas from the compiler. And this is, I mean, of course, part of the design of the language. Um, so if you don't like it, I mean, this is kind of where it's at. I doubt it's going to get much simpler. Your alternatives are probably Swift or maybe Haskell. I don't know. So have at it. Um, I'm kidding, of course. I know there are lots of there actually are lots of other platforms. Like um, your guy who gave the presentation a couple months back, talking about Elm and his platform he was working on. You know, so there's a lot of people are kind of tackling, you know, what Rust is doing from different angles. Although I would say that uh, that link that that platform was a lot more loosely typed than Rust. So um, next, uh, none of the next key trade-offs with Rust, of course, and I've hinted at this a lot. Um, is that uh, performance over convenience. And so Rust by its nature really, really cares about performance. Uh, its history as a Mozilla project meant that, you know, for them to be able to replace parts of the most Mozilla browser, which itself, as I mentioned, is a massive C++ code base. Um, that's what they wanted to do with it. And so what they had to be able to do was, you know, have transparent memory access and give developers tools to reason about how intensive their programs will be, which, you know, almost 95% of the time comes down to really just being able to mem re reason about memory allocations. And if you can get that down and you can tighten that up, um, that's where, you know, the lion's share of, uh, of, of optimizations and code bases come. Um, and this is, of course, is because 
Rust doesn't do much magic under the hood um, with memory allocation. And so kind of to demonstrate this, this table that I have here, um, I've included it from the embedded Rust book, which is actually really cool if you go out and Google it, Rust embedded, um, I believe, is, or just, yeah, Rust embedded or the Rust embedded book, they've, they've got an online document for it. Uh, and this, this table outlines the impact of marking your crate. And so that's, uh, when I talk about marking the crate, that would be within that cargo TOML file, which I mentioned is the manifest, specifying um, no STD. And so what that means is basically building this the crate, your dependency, whether it's an application or a library, without any dependencies on the Rust standard library. And so what you can see here, what you get when you, when you do no STD is you basically, you lose heap allocated types. And so things that build on top of heap allocation, so specifically there's some uh, mem alloc, uh, a method within there that does, you know, for doing heap allocations, um, the things that build upon that in the library, like vectors, which is basically uh, where you would use like a linked list, you know, or just an infinitely expanding list, although the implementation is different um, from the linked list, so it's not fair to call it that, but you'd use it basically in the same way, um, or hash maps, which is like a, their equivalent of a dictionary type. Um, you basically don't have access to any of that. Uh, you can see stack overflow protection um, gets stripped out. Um, there is some, there's certain way, certain libraries or dependencies where you can specify initialization code, which will actually be ran before the main entry point of the program that goes away. Um, and then of course the standard library, which is, you know, the majority um, of, you know, the officially supported code is within there, but there's a smaller library called libcore that has basically all uh, stack allocated types and uh, abstractions that is still available. And what you get when you strip away the standard library is a massively smaller um, binary that is appropriate for using when you're writing firmwares, doing firmware code or kernels or, uh, or boot, boot, yeah, bootloader stuff. So, you know, the fact that that's possible in Rust is kind of a, te a testament to kind of where, you know, they're going because we take it for granted that languages like C just do that out of the box because they were purpose built for that because of the era in which they were built and the abstractions that were, you know, at the time of C's debut was considered incredibly high level. But nowadays what C considers high level is actually really low level for what us as application developers deal with. So to come back and actually appro approach that and take that problem on to be able to meet it there um, requires a lot of stuff that, you know, you have to think about and deal with. Um, that you know doesn't isn't obvious at first. You, know, you think, oh, this would be easy. I could I could do you know, you know, like any anything more complicated than a than a fourth interpreter. Basically, it gets really hard. Um, so the next um, item, of course, I I mentioned you know with uh, key trade offs in Rust is memory safety. Um, memory safety is really really important, and so pretty much when anybody's talking about safety in Rust, really they're just talking about memory safety. And so that, and that's, it's pretty important to kind of grasp that. Um, and, you know, there's some things kind of that I'll hint at and, and, and talk about in this uh, talk that um, I, I, I gloss over, but I just want to reemphasize. So things like move types, uh, value consumptions, they, they constitute what's called a linear type, like in type theory, which means basically like a, a thing that's there or not. And, you know, it, it specifies that like as part of a type's life cycle, you include the concept of it being consumed and being destroyed. And so with that um, and how it complements the borrowing uh, lifetime system in Rust, um, it natural patterns arise that kind of allow developers to design systems that I think, you know, include that kind of safety. Um, and then also examples um, that I show in this talk with closures and uh, like, you know, Lambda methods, basically, they allied a lot with how Rust distinguishes between pure functions and closures within code. And, you know, the difference between a pure function and a closure is closures capture values out of their enclosing lexical environment and then incorporate that as part of their value for their lifetime. So that has implications for, you know, um, in a, in, a, in a language where um, you do manual memory management that don't come up in, in uh, garbage collected languages. Um, if any of you, I don't know if any are, there are C++ who are modern C++ developers here, um, you know that when they introduce the Lambda syntax, there's also a pretty heavy syntax for uh, captures and how captures happen. Um, and so Rust also has to account for some of that stuff. Um, but anyway, the, the important thing is that the 
because of memory safety and because of the borrowing system, there's a subtle and difficult to reason about issues that can arise, um, particularly when working with higher order functions. And I will get into some of that. I do have a question about the uh, borrow system. I, I, if I remember correctly, um, there is only, you can have multiple writers and one reader. Is that the, is that the you're, situation? You're talking about for referencing for mutable versus immutable references? Yeah. It's the, so it'll be the other way around and it depends on what's happening. So if there are mutable references held, then you can't take a mutable reference because you might mutate it out from somebody. But when, um, or excuse me, it's the other way around. So you can hold you can hold multiple immutable references, but only a single mutator at a time. And then um, if a mutable reference is held, then new immutable references won't be allowed. Okay. Um, I guess wrapping up on this with the trade-offs, um, you know, if you imagine a continuum with the Lambda calculus on the left-hand side and machine instructions on the right, uh, for me, Rust comes down somewhere in the center right. Um, like I said, it, it, it includes and talk and, and a lot of stuff in its type system and conveniences that are obviously descended from the, the ML line of languages. Um, and as I mentioned, um, besides C++, uh, Graydon Hoare himself is a big OCaml guy. Um, but uh, in the end, again and again, where it has to, Russ always goes on the side of basically coming down more towards C and C++ as it, as it has to do with memory management. Um, and so for that reason, there's a bunch of kind of, you know, you kind of end up kicking the box out from underneath a bunch of uh, functional stuff that you'd have otherwise. So next, um, I want to go ahead and do a whirlwind tour of Rust syntax and features. And so um, I'm going to talk about all these items. I'm just going to kind of blow through a uh, source code file that I have kind of set aside for this um, to talk about these things. So first we have control flow. And so as you see here, um, you know, ifs, the blocks are always there, but there's no parens that are necessary. Um, and, you know, basically C style if, if and else, we, we have here is basically um, expression style use of if and else to capture a value out of it. The compiler will look and verify, you know, and it does all the type, the type stuff to make sure you don't return, you know, uh, you know, type, type F out of another one and type T out of the other, you know, so you have to match all that stuff up. You get all that for free, of course, because this is a statically typed language, you know, you all of these things, even though you don't specify explicit type, um, you can get pretty far in Rust without having to specify the type at the point of uh, when you where you define variables. But occasionally, um, it becomes the thing if there's you know enough ambiguity in what it is that's being done. Um, next, we want to talk about uh, closures, of course. So this is. Um, the syntax right here for just a basic closure, you can see that has multiple statements. It doesn't emit any uh, return values and um, it has no input. So if there was values in here, like this would be, you know, this would become an input value that would need to be provided. Um, but what it does show is it shows capturing out of the environment. And so this is a closure. This isn't a pure function because it doesn't take any inputs. It doesn't return any outputs. So it's kind of a black box what it does. So, I mean, by that, by there, kind of, you know, questions whether it could be pure. But it also is capturing this value out of here. And it's doing this by taking a mutable reference to this already stored mutable value. Um, and of course, in terms of stuff that Rust does for free, if that mute went away from after the let keyword, then suddenly this is an immutable value and we can't take a mutable reference to that. So this kind of gives a hint to kind of how um, Rust deals with mutability at the point of slot definition. So like if you have a structure that has values within it, um, the, those values themselves don't have their mutability specified. It's always at the point of the, the exterior storage of the enclosing type. And so, you know, you can have basically cascading, um, you know, hierarchies arise out of that. There are some library types that are meant kind of to do or to allow you to have that I, I kind of by their nature and design allow basically side effects to leak out of what looks like an immutable type. Um, and that mostly happens with like unsafe code under the cover, under the covers, and it's kind of in, you know, limited circumstances. Um, but uh, like I said here with this example, you can see this is a, a closure capturing a value and then doing a mutation on it. It has to, this right here is it dereferencing the value because this is a reference, of course. 
um, and then so that it can mutate it and then coming down here actually you know executing that that type or that that uh you know function that was specified here this closure and then being able to look at you know its value before and after um, next i want to talk really briefly about kind of uh, array types so one of the things that's notable about them is that uh their length is a part of their value specification. And I guess also speaking really briefly, I didn't, I mean, talking about basic syntax. So let is of course, you know, familiar with OCaml, you know, it's specifying a type. This is the variable name. If you're specifying the explicit type, it follows after with the colon like so. And then this of course is uh, initialization. Uh, Rust is, you know, one of those languages that will let you initialize empty values. There's no concept of a null value within the core language, within the safe core language itself. So everything needs to be initialized and it validates that. Um, here you can see this is basically different syntax for initialization like if you wanted to just you know build out an empty 500 element array you can see how you can do that or you can specify each individual item or of course you know at runtime of course you're going to have different values um you know they're, they're going to be dynamically constructed um but it's interesting to note that like i said that um length is a part of uh, array type specification and so this right here this is a this is a stack allocated type um is, is what that is and so of course we have normal uh, indexing into arrays and then we have typical uh you know types um or you know basically convenience helper functions out of the standard library um you can see that uh the arrays are stack allocated so we can basically look at the memory footprint of it and actually see that it's going to be size of int 32 times 500 or whatever um, and then we get into kind of a basic example of borrowing. So I mentioned this before up here with this, uh, you know, this constitutes a borrow taking a reference to this thing. And so borrowing refers to the system of the compiler. Um, it's its referencing system, but it's accounting for all references taken and it's making making sure that any reference taken uh, doesn't violate mutability constraints based upon the type. It makes sure that any reference is taken, that the value where the reference is taken isn't released while a reference is held. Uh, you know, a bunch of things that ensure kind of the soundness and, and memory safety guarantees of the language. So what this ends up being is a slice, which, you know, a reference referring to, and so this is a special type annotation. So it looks like the uh, array, but it doesn't have the length specification as part of the type signature, and it just has this to specify. So this is just, it just lets you know that this is some amount of elements of um, type I32, and then it's able to work upon them here. Um, another thing that's interesting, of course, is that because um, array types are static at the time of definition, you can see that uh, this particular definition of this type XS, uh, this is invalid because you know, it only has five elements. So with a zero based array index, this is uh, beyond. So that's kind of just, you know, showing what it is there. Um, next, I wanna talk about enums. It's funny, kind of enums popped up before uh, talking about structs. And so you can kind of construct more, cons you know, more complex types out of comp uh, combinations of the two. But um, enums of course are, you know, algebraic data types uh, if you're familiar with them from uh you know f sharp ocaml and uh, haskell you know they're there it's these are kind of basic enums but of course enums can be have like arbitrary density or complexity um this is an example uh, so i mean really quick you can see you know kind of the ways that you can do pattern matching that arises off of enums that's kind of really the interest you know exhaustive pattern matching um is 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 probably one of the main things and de the destructuring that you're allowed to do out of that. Um, and, you know, you want, and, 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 and of course, enums are also like in memory, they're, they're similar to a tagged unions in C. So basically what they carry is, you know, a region that's the size of the largest enum variant and then a tag. And then it knows basically to swap out the contents based on what the current variant is. Um, but in memory, you know, they look basically like C unions with an additional tag. Um, this is an example of a slightly more complex list that pretty much mimics like a cons style, um, you know, linked list where the, the enum can have two possible values. It's either um, this contents of itself, which is its current value, and then a box, which is, you know, heap allocated value pointing to the next item in the linked list. And that thing itself can either be another one of these, 
or it can be a nil value specifying the end of the list. Um, so that's kind of an example, you know, how, um, you know, ways that enums can be used. But I mean, really like enums arise um, in systems, like you'll see a lot of like, I don't know, error types that are manifested as enums so that each variant can carry custom information. Um, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, TC, you know, TCP packet processor, the variants might be different kinds of, high, you know, pack, uh, packet, packet protocols built on top of TCP, um, you know, the, the, the sky's the limit. And so, of course, if you guys uh, come from uh, a, a functional programming background, particularly in Haskell or F-sharp or uh, OCaml, then that is uh, nothing new. Um, moving on, of course, we have structs as well, which are pretty much more uh, C style memory layout um, data structures. So those are really um, straightforward. You can also have what are called unit structs, which basically function as like atoms. They have no value except for themselves or like, a, or like a, an enum with only a single variant um, is another way to think about them. Um, and then you can also have tuple values where you don't care about the names or identifiers of them. You just care about them as basically, you know, ordered uh, combinations of values, which will destructure at some point in the future. Um, I haven't shown it really here, but uh, Rust includes robust destructuring syntax like you would do in Haskell or uh, OCaml or F Sharp. Um, so, you know, taking apart values and then all of the um, destructuring capability exists in the pattern matching system itself. And um, as time goes on, Rust seems to get, um, they're actually putting a lot of work into kind of making the pattern matching system itself more robust and more convenient to use. Um, but that stuff is totally like, I don't, I don't have time uh, to cover that, unfortunately. I'm already over time. <laughs> um, and moving on uh, to the next item, um, I wanted to talk about the bar, kind of give a practical example of the borrowing system itself. So this function itself kind of constitutes uh, kind of a discussion of, of, of kind of gotchas with the borrowing system. So when we start out with this, we're creating two values. One of them is a boxed value that just contains an integer. Um, if you're, I guess, you know, F sharp and OCaml style kind of uh, annotations, you can also do stuff like, uh, excuse me, you know, like that and to have instead of commas for breaking up large numeric values. Um, and then, but Rust has for its type literals, basically, uh, you know, I32, U32, and 64, et cetera. Um, and those things are, you know, they, they come out naturally in the expressions of the types. There's no, you know, there's no platform dependent, like whatever the platform says a number is like that thing, how there is in C, where you can have 16 or 32 or 64 bit integers, uh, depending on the platform standard. So here we lay out these two values, one is boxed and one's placed on the stack. Um, and then this, these, this, all these methods do, is basically just exists to kind of demonstrate uh, what they would do with these things. So with the with the function signature of this, this borrowed i32 value, it is a reference that's been taken to this thing. And contrast that against this eat box i32, what it does is it takes this by value. And so it says this function takes ownership of the box because of the way that this is annotated, it's taking the box by value. So whenever this is called, that value goes away. So here we have some examples of how we can see, we can borrow and work on these values, uh, maybe do them, use them for subordinate, you know, uh, calculations or whatever. And, you know, th these, these methods save memory because they just do pointer access to this thing that lives on a higher level, higher frame of the stack, instead of having to pass it by value and copy it into their own stack or something like that. So, you know, there's that convenience there. Um, and then within this nested block, we see doing some things like here, that boxed value, which, you know, it represents a heap allocated value, but it exists as a value. Um, they have a reference taken to it. And so that reference can be used within here. But if we did something like this, like uncommenting this method right here and ate it, then what happens is this boxed um, value, it would be destroyed at this point, or it'd be consumed and not, um, not you know, emitted out. And so this breaks right now because that subsequent um, call to try and borrow it, but it becomes, this becomes legal once, you know, that's commented out. Also, subsequently, because of that, this call now is no longer valid because the, that, this boxed value is already eaten up here. So these are all things that are basically happening just because of, um, oops, I commented the wrong line. Um, these are things that 
are happening because of Rust's borrow checking system. And pretty much all it's doing is, you know, validating um, that what you're doing with variable, what you're doing with, you know, values and their variables and how you're referring to them, that all of it basically ties out within the current context. And it's able, you know, to do this across functions and, you know, across function call boundaries and then, you know, basically to the entire boundaries within a crate and then doing whole program analysis when it actually links a program together to, you know, enforce these constraints. Um, next, uh, I want to talk briefly about traits. Like I said, this is how you kind of spec, this is how you do like inheritance polymorphism, um, which you would do with classes in C sharp or with, um, you know, type classes, which uh, tra rest traits are almost exactly like, um, you're able to basically specify the trait and say, here's the behavior I want implemented. You can provide default implementations. These can also be, you know, overridden in implementers. Um, the Rust provides the ability to do like a bare implementation just against a structure itself. So these will be basically tight. These will be methods that will be available when you're interacting with the concrete type itself. If this was cast or type into, you know, cast or boxed into just the trait, then there would be basically those things aren't available, you know, so this is, you know, kind of, you know, uh, encapsulation and hiding uh, functionality. And then finally, we have the implementation of the animal trait for a sheep, basically with the defining of methods that do things on the sheep itself. Um, all of this is kind of, you know, really noisy, but just to kind of demonstrate, like I said, they're kind of this three-way pivot. And so it's interesting where, you know, you either have to own a concrete type or the trait itself in order to do anything useful. So if you have like a library type and you, the, and, you know, you, and there's a trait that you wanted to have it implement, like, you know, the, the challenge to be able to do that, um, it kind of becomes tricky based on where things are. And so it's, you know, you, you're expected to be able to have like, in, you know, interior ownership of either a trait or a concrete type. Um, and then uh, finally, oh no, excuse me, that was just the thing for that. Okay, ready to move on. So that was kind of, like I said, just kind of a quick um, overview of uh, the syntax. Was there anything here that was like really puzzling or weird to anybody? I know I'm covering a whole bunch of stuff and I'm moving really fast. Is there any questions before I move on? Sure, uh, just a real quick question. Um, can the implementations, I mean, do they have to, I guess, you said you had to own either the uh, trait or the class. So yeah. can the implementations occur in like other files? So if I import like type animal from a, from a cargo, yeah. but from a, a, you know, a, a, a package, and then I can implement yeah. that for sheep. or I could implement, or I could import sheep and then implement animal mm -hmm. for sheep. In my uh no it's at the crate boundary and so yeah. you can't pull in someone else's you know crate and then you know because it's like if there's like a library that you want that has a trait and then some some other you know library that you want to implement that trait for like you don't own either sure. of those things so you have to ask one okay. or the other basically you know to yeah okay cool thanks all right uh, finally um, so we can talk about uh, functional rust now. Now we're here. We're here to the meat of it. Last. Um, so in order to talk about functional rust, we have to kind of set some boundaries around what exactly is functional. Functional. Uh, so for this, I'm going to kind of give the hand wavy answer of saying that um, there are certain principles which make code more functional. Some languages make this easier or harder to adhere to, and generally speaking, languages that make it easier to adhere to functional principles are considered functional languages. And even if they do that though, they often, um, they make it harder to violate these functional principles, but however, you know, almost always there's some way for you to do it, um, to break, you know, functional princip principle encapsulation or whatever you want to call it, uh, if the situation demands it. Um, but in general, we have these things that we say, if a language or a system is more like this, or it supports this, then we consider it more functional. And so those things are, I guess, really briefly, I would say mutability, um, you know, having to do with kind of how you treat values and how they're changed and how, you know, they are applied within functions. Um, I would say recursion is an important part of it. And then also, of course, I would say higher order functions um, and kind of function pipelining uh, become, you know, are, are, are things that are kind of like, you know, they really play out a lot uh, in, in, in functional languages and kind of become core things. So with that in mind, um, 
I would say talking about mutability, um, I mean, just looking at, excuse me, some of the previous examples, like where we talked about with the borrowing system, I think that it's pretty self-evident that, you know, Rust has strong controls around mutability. Of course, it allows you to break those, you know, rules or just to, to make things mutable. Um, but out of the box and the behavior, um, you know, it's perfectly possible to write pure functions and pure programs uh, in Rust, you know, because of just, you know, the, 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 ba the basic building blocks are there. Um, next, when I talk about recursion, I'll just say really quick, uh, Rust doesn't have any tail call optimization. Um, so if you want to do a system where you're going to, where you would have something like some implement, you know, infinite um, recursion, um, you will, you can and will very much get stack overflows like this example here shows. Um, you absolutely, you know, will blow up in this case because this will just recurse until it runs out of stack. Um, you know, in uh, you don't really need to implement your own trampoline, which is uh, the way, you know, that like you kind of do a recursion like uh, uh, functionality in systems that don't have it. Um, because we have, uh, Rust has what are called iterators, which is pretty much a, a trait and a language support feature for doing iteration over, um, you know, values that are, that are amenable to be iterated over and the way that it's implemented it allows you to kind of have like dynamic infinite objects or objects that block the next time you try to go to an iteration or something like that so that you'd end up doing a lot of the things um, that you would when you use uh, recursion as a control flow mechanism in functional programming um, and then of course talking again about a uh, higher order functions um, you know this is kind of the idea right that where you pretty much just compose pipelines of functions working on values and mutating them until eventually you get the thing you want. And so this is kind of an idiomatic example um, of how, you know, you would take, you know, create create a value from zero to 100 and then, you know, double those and then sum them back together. And so you can kind of see, I just, I, I had just kind of the Haskell golf um, parlor trick version of this to put it alongside what you would do in Rust to show that while it is a bit more verbose, um, it's, uh, you know, pretty close. And that being said, I'll say that a lot of the cool stuff that you're used to, if you're doing a lot of hardcore, um, like statically typed functional programming, and also I'll say this as a Haskell baby, um, I'm, I'm pretty new to Haskell. I, I mostly come to it through Elm and I've wanted to do more, um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still I'm still on that journey. But uh, a lot of stuff that you, you know, would do idiomatically in those languages, like currying doesn't exist, um, like point free style, like, uh, like pipelining um, doesn't exist in Rust. So you do kind of, you know, the, the same tools aren't there kind of to use higher order functions in um, um, in like really, you know, I, I guess like intention revealing and declare in more declarative ways because Rust makes you do a lot more gate, uh, bookkeeping. And also um, the thing I mentioned earlier about memory safety and closures, um, it's really easy when you're working with closures. So these are these are all just pure functions. These are like these are reified as function pointers at runtime. They don't have any any additional state. Um, with them because they don't capture anything out of enclosing uh, context. But as soon as you start having things where like it really makes sense to do that and you start capturing stuff, it becomes really hard to actually use a closure. And so um, you have to kind of fall back to a couple of things like generic traits and methods that consume them. Um, and it kind of, you know, it, it, it gets complicated and it, it limits utility. And this kind of plays into the memory safety. And uh, especially once you get into like multi-threaded programming, because almost any like, you know, like, like, like in C or C, like ultimately in any language, you know, or any asynchronous backend, when you want to spawn a new thread or some kind of background process, you say run this function pointer basically is what it always comes down to. And so in Rust at the point where you have to pass that function pointer, if it's not, you know, just a bare function pointer, then things get complicated. So that's where, you know, like if you're trying to capture anything, you know, useful, um, that's a, that's a situation that rises in Rust where, you know, I think developers uh, end up having their hands tied. And then last, um, like I said, kind of, you know, because recursion isn't there, what we see instead is um, iterators. And so this right here is just the declaration of a vector. So this is a special shorthand form for declaring a vector, which is uh, Rust's name for like a linked list or a dynamically expanding list um, with what they would be in other languages. Um, and so then this is kind of the natural uh, way to iterate over them. But what's happening here actually is this is all desugared syntax. 
um, for basically doing this. And so if you, if you, you know, kind of this stuff right here, this is kind of what it actually looks like at runtime. And so what we're doing here with this vector is we're turning it into an iterator and we're, you know, making it mutable, of course, in the process. And then um, you have to iterate over it in that process. And so this while is pretty much simulating that process. This next um, returns uh, an option. And so this let sum is actually kind of, is, is a, is a sort of, um, it's a, it's a sort of conditional expression that's saying while the result of, of this next call is a sum value, because this actually returns an option, which is a sum or a none of T. And so this says while, while this iterator.next call is returning a sum, and this is the value that's bound for use within this block, um, keep running this while loop. But once this next reaches the end, it'll return a none, and then this this loop would break out. So that's kind of that's kind of like what this boils down to. And so just looking at that and seeing that, you can kind of see that you know taking this syntax and kind of boiling it down to just this is a win. And you can also see that within this natural form, a lot of opportunities to do kind of neat, tricky stuff arise where, you know, the iterator is actually like something that's blocking on external input or, you know, incoming packets in a server or stuff like that. Like there's a lot of, you know, stuff. And this, these are the same places um, where you would see like, uh, like um, lazy evaluation used in Haskell. All right, so that was functional rest. <laughs> um, all right, so with that out of the way, I wanted to talk a bit um, about kind of like how you would, um, how people are using Rust in different contexts. So um, Rust is really, I mean, popular, and I think a lot of people come to it in the context of uh, like backend services that are doing a lot of um, like data work, low level IO, or lots of like, um, you know, like DSP type stuff. And these are things that I think a lot of people before now were doing in Node.js, but kind of they hit the limits performance wise, particularly around like DSP work um, that, you know, you see where naturally if they wanted to go away from, you know, a high level async IO engine like Node, they would have to move their next place to go would basically be to C, um, you know, so now like Rust is becoming more popular in that space. Um, of course, there's a lot of like if you got anybody here is into like blockchain technology, Rust is, you know, a lot of the um, newer, like I'd say, like post Ethereum or the, the, quote, the, the Ethereum killer blockchains are coming out. A lot of them like a, um, a Solana um, are uh, having, you know, Rust support as kind of a first class thing. So that's pretty exciting. Um, but there's other places where it's rough, more rough, like uh, some of the tooling, especially for like using Rust as web services are kind of like more like, you know, application level web services. The tooling is there, but it's rough. So like if you want to use Rust to stand up a RESTful API with JOT authentication, you'll have a lot of stuff that you're going to have to, you know, stumble over, especially once you come into dealing with, you know, integrating with your actual, uh, you know, security or your, your actual authentication provider, whatever that is, um, you know, like in a robust modern infrastructure, you're not, you know, the way that we do authentication, a lot, a lot of that uh, tooling is, is, is still not great, in my opinion. And for raw web application work, I mean, Rust itself doesn't have a lot to offer over something like Nginx serving up, you know, app, you know, like an Angular application. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's not a big win there in that space, in my opinion, but I, some people insist on using it um, that way. But I think that hopefully once the tooling gets better, particularly around web services, I hope that, you know, Rust will become a good option, especially because of how expressive the type system is. Uh, Rust is, on the other hand, seeing a lot of uh, uh, uptake in developer tooling, um, especially in the web application infrastructure space. Uh, if anybody is, you know, really into web application development, Next.js. Um, has rewritten their the, pretty much their tooling stack on top of Rust uh, command line tools. Rome, um, which is the su successor to the Babel transpiler, if you're familiar with that, you know, it's kind of one of the first TypeScript transpilers, or excuse me, like ES 2015 transpilers that was out there, you know, that was providing ways to kind of, you know, write more modern uh, versions of JavaScript and then spit them out in, you know, more browser consumable forms. Um, so Rome, the success for, successor to Babel, uh, written by the same author, he is using Rust for that. And there's a lot of others, Deno, SWC, and Parcel. Um, a lot of like, uh, I believe Google, not, or excuse me, not Google, but uh, Cloudflare and Amazon both have um, quick parsers when you know, like HTTP, HTTP 3.0 uh, parsers written in Rust. Um, so 
Uh, if you want to learn more about that, there's a really good, uh, pretty recent blog post on the topic called Rust is the Future of JavaScript Infrastructure that you can look at to learn more. Um, of course, Rust has a lot of interest in Buzz and also Hate, I would say, in the game dev community. Um, there really aren't any like big AAA games that have shipped written in Rust, but it definitely has a lot of interest and there's some great tooling um, that's there. I like to play around with engines and uh, there's tons of engines and stuff like that to play with in Rust. Uh, if you want to check out one in that, you could look at the Bevy engine, the B-E-V-Y. Um, it's a really interesting kind of um, evented architecture um, for a Rust game or you know, like data oriented, um, like an ECS system. Um, of course, embedded programming is a, is a popular a thing. I talked about that earlier with the no STD annotation and kind of the applications that you can get and what the impact of that is. And of course, while Rust is a challenge and more and, you know, more space constrained, like 8-bit processors, you know, where it's hard to even use C and you probably, you know, you probably have fourth or just straight up machine code. Um, Rust is finding uptake on, you know, platforms that have more headroom. Um, all the tooling and design is there to embed Rust in a way that just isn't possible in most other languages, like I talked about, because they're really grasping with the consequences of trying to have a really C memory compatible language. And dovetailing with the above, of course, um, the Linux kernel itself is starting to make space. And the, recently, they've done some things to make it possible to basically write drivers and Linux kernel modules in Rust. Um, chances are there won't ever be Rust itself in the Linux kernel tree um, because they're, you know, uh, GPL three people and Rust is an MIT code base. But I mean, you know, the Rust code itself or whatever, you know, they, they, I, I, my understanding is that they're just not super enthused about the idea of starting to take on Rust, but vendors will be able to start writing uh, kernel modules and shipping them with their products or, you know, or individual companies that, you know, if you're a company that's a big enough deal to have your own, you know, custom kernel modules, think Facebook, Google, et cetera, they have the tools to be able to use this. Um, really quickly talking about the future of um, uh, Rust, some really cool things that are coming down the pike. Um, so this is stabilization of a feature called GAT, which is uh, generic associated types. And so this is an exciting addition that extends associated types, which is a uh, it's a feature that I didn't even talk about in this talk. That goes to show um, I barely even I, I didn't even really talk about polymorph, you know, like real type polymorphism that we, that is available in Rust. But um, associated types are a way to kind of specify like a type slot on a trait separate from like a generic constraint itself. And it just means that the implementers have to specify that type and then they can reference that type within you know, their implementation. Um, and so this is an extension to associated types that allow you to have additional uh, generic annotations on top of that, which kind of gets us pretty close to the idea of types that are abstracted over that are type, uh, you know, a, a thing that can deal with a type that is an abstraction over other abstractions itself. So kind of, you know, like a, a way to chip at higher kind of types within Rust and then combining that with what are um, with feature that's called const generics, which refers specifically to allow uh, the embedding of const information within a type um, as a dynamic parameter. And so, and really quickly kind of to demonstrate what that is like um, in the example uh, over here where I was talking about um, the use of uh, arrays. So this is a, this is a, a, a feature or, you know, a, uh, basically a part of the type itself and so that comes out as like you know item of t with you know uh, a length of k and so there are t items and they have a k they have a length of k um and so within within these right here within arrays that the type is a is a part of their um their type definition but you can't specify a generic type or, or like set a generic constraint where you can say you have a type of T and that, you know, the, 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 the length component itself is a generic, is a generic thing that can be deferred until further on. And so um, this isn't really the greatest explanation for it, but the idea is that they're making it so that you can have, you know, generic um, you can you can make things that would be that would be size fixed at compile time, like into generic constraints. So you can have like basically a type that represents 
um, like a, a fixed length of something. And so that it'll be pretty interesting for like what's possible in the future. And I think these two things put together um, are going to kind of be what gets the community towards, you know, being able to have the expressiveness that a lot of folks are looking for with higher kind of types um, within Rust. So it's pretty exciting. And um, this stuff is kind of coming down the pike. Uh, hopefully, like in the next year, we'll see it on the main branches. Is there a concept of like uh, generic constraints on those where yeah. um, uh, you can say uh, it's an implementation of this? Yeah, of this you can you can say T. Yeah, I, I I don't I don't think I have an example, of, but yes, there are generic constraints as as robust as you know. I don't know. So with GAT, could you, for example, say um, uh, this? Um, this function operates on um, an X of T where X is a um, applicative. Yeah. So the with GAT itself, this is going to manifest the the annotation um, for for associated types. It appears within traits themselves. So what it'll allow you to do is write traits that abstract over a type that itself abstracts over an additional type. And you can place well, and so additionally, so the 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 kind of the thing as well, and and something that I completely didn't cover, because like I said, there's just the space is too large in the time that we have. Um, you can also place generic constraints around lifetimes, so you can set constraints, and you can carry lifetimes as generic uh, parameters themselves. If you ever see like a a, a, a lowercase letter preceded by a dash within a, a within a generic definition, that's a that's basically a lifetime constraint, and so it's about being able to put lifetimes and um, within a thing. And so you can specify a trait that is like a T that has a lifetime associated with it that's pegged to some outside type. Cause that's mostly where like how, like within the borrowing system, that's kind of where lifetimes appear within type annotations is so you can say the type that I'm creating, it's gonna carry, it's gonna contain this other thing. And I'm gonna guarantee that my type lives as long, at least as long as this thing does. And you kind of, you're giving the compiler that information. And so um, that's a lot of like what it's gonna be used for. But um, I mean, yeah, you wouldn't write a function that way. You basically would write a trait that would have that GAT specification. And then it's gonna have methods on specified on it that do those things. And then a concrete type comes along and implements that and kind of fills it, fills the rest out. Although it might still be generic for its T, right? So, you know, cause that's the, the higher kindedness of it. Awesome. Until it's actually applied at runtime, until it's applied by a consumer, you know, who actually fills out the inner, the inner type. Um, yeah, I guess so that, that gets into question. So this is the end. <laughs> um, if I had uh, any recommendations, it would be uh, to check out the rustlang.org uh, website. Um, it's incred incredibly robust and a great gateway. Uh, if you want to actually interact with the community, the first place I would recommend going, and maybe this is a generational thing, I don't know, but I would recommend going to the Discord. They have a huge community there. There's like like it's it's like it's like a like a mass like an IRC network level you know large in, in terms of how many people are there and active, and um, you know a lot of the a lot of the core team are there and you know um, I don't know if actual development work happens there I believe that the the Rust organization itself maintains a separate chat system off of Discord I forget the name, um, but there's a lot of a lot of stuff there and that's a great entryway. There's of course there's a Reddit community that's really active. Um, you know, if you spend any time on Stack Overflow, there's a lot of Rust activity there, a very popular language on, on Stack Overflow. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities, of course, um, to interact and, and get involved uh, with the community. I recall uh, there's also a Slack that's fairly active. Oh, really? Yeah, I see. I was going to uh, ask a quick question. Um, so one of the things I really like the the trait system in Rust, but I also was intrigued by the macro system. And like, it seems like there's a lot of macros that help with quality of life in, in coding, like the VEC macro and the, um, the print macro. Is it like, are there a lot of people writing macros these days or do people sort of just, you know, use yeah. the full of macros that, that exist? No, or there's a lot of, I mean, like most, so diesel, which is a, a ORM library makes pervasive use of macros kind of for specifying like ORM models. And then basically, you know, based on like how you specify within um, the macro, it spits out all the trade implementations and the actual, you know, underlying structures. And then, you know, by convention, how to utilize it. 
Um, CERDE, which is kind of the major de facto serialization framework, makes use of um, macros. And so macros in Rust is kind of a tricky thing because there's multiple things that are called macros. Like there's things that look like attribute annotations that are actually macros. And then there's actual like inline code macros, like where you do, where you're basically doing like hygienic code substitution. So yeah, the, um, the, the exclamation point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of what I was thinking about. And I think like the hygienic yeah. code substitution um it actually gets you a long way to yeah dsls uh, yeah imprint yeah implementing higher kinda types as well like just you know you, you can do a lot of sort of interesting parameters and and, and functions on on I, especially like with the the vec macro right you don't have to specify the the length of your the array to create a to vec in your mm -hmm. code um yeah it's it's it seemed like something that was really kind of a neat feature but yeah um, i don't know if the vec macro right on your own <laughs> what's that also challenging to write on your own. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's easier than machine code. I'll say that. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, I mean the, the macros, not the, not Rust. Rust is, Rust is nice. Uh, I, I guess that was it. I was just kind of curious what the status was on, on macros these days. I mean, they're, they're available. I, I, hygienic macros are in the main language. You can, you know, it's, they're in stable Rust. So I'm, I'm a little disappointed Paul McWhorter didn't show up uh, today. He's he's a uh, mostly does C and C plus plus development for um, like video streaming type. Uh, oh yeah, DSP. embedded applications. So uh, yeah, I, I I was I was really hoping he'd show up just just for the questions. Um, yeah, that's a sweet spot that, uh, you know, rest is there for. And I mean, it's, you know, I think the proof is in the pudding with, you know, the folks that are using it. I think that if you follow, um, or if you saw what Mozilla, um, was doing with, you know, their kind of experimental browser project, um, you know, they're doing some really interesting stuff and kind of, you know, just be experimenting with different layout engines because, you know, I mean, HTML, HTML display is a hard problem. It turns out, and, uh, companies that maintain browsers put a lot of effort into making them fast. So it's a major, you know, kind of desktop optimization problem. Yeah, so I found myself thinking through your whole presentation uh, about the talking head song, what's in a lifetime? You know, you may find yourself. Right. It's like, I don't see Rust as something yeah. I would do like in my normal day-to-day -day stuff. But if I found myself like doing an embedded IoT sort of thing, or you know, there's yeah. it, it has these like use cases that are beyond things that I would use by normal languages, which is like F sharp or C sharp or whatever, right? Yeah. Like, there are clearly things where this would be interesting and it has the things that I find necessary. Like, I want discriminated unions. I want record types. I want to be able to do things in a reasonable fashion. Like, I'm not really crazy about the semicolons and brackets sort of thing, but, you know, I can deal with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would, I, I would, I guess, the goal of the Rust compiler is to not have you go. Where is my beautiful wife? This isn't my. This isn't my beautiful house. So nobody's. Nobody's going to come out there and, and 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 free it from under you. You know so that's that's the goal. So uh, that is how it is. Rust is like a talking head song for sure. I just watched that video the other day too. I kind of want to just stop the recording now. Um, yeah. That was perfect. Uh uh, um, so I want to ask a question that is is probably totally unfair um, about sort of like the uh, the longevity, stability, and, and future of Rust. And and the the idea that I have here is um, so the SQLite and Tickle conference was today, and Richard Hip, the creator of SQLite, gave a keynote basically on the state of SQLite. And um, one of the things that he was talking about is that one, he's, there's a sort of interest 
um, not just from people, but also from apparently companies um, in like, would you rewrite SQLite and Rust? And he's like, oh, I don't know about that. But he also has this sense that like within the next 10, 20 years, contracts are gonna be like, your software has to be memory safe. It just has to be. And that through contracts, C is just not gonna be acceptable anymore. And so he was sort of putting it out there to the conference of like, what do you think about this? And what do you, like Rust is the obvious choice right now, today, of like trying to occupy this C area, um, but being memory safe. And, and you got a bunch of SQL and tickle people and they're like, well, you know, it hasn't been around for 30 years. So we, we don't know. Yeah, but it's, it's worth, but, it's worth it's, mentioning that like, I believe SQLite is written in ANSI C and is very portable. So yeah. like there, there's a certain perspective and also like a major historical inertia to that code base. Also, it's like, isn't it like Zlib license? Like it has, it has like a, I know it doesn't have like a typical open source license. That's uh, he, he, he talked about that. <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't. He, he didn't talk about it. It was, a, it was another presentation. It apparently has a blessing license, <laughs> which is use this for whatever you wish with our blessing. Like, but yeah, it's anyone can use it for basically so, anything. You know, there's like maybe 10 or 20 people I would trust with C. And he's one of them, right? And, and I think the the point about like, yeah, at some point C is not going to be acceptable. Like, we're going to have to do the stuff that we did in C in some other language. Because I don't trust very many people in C. I mean, most it, shops that are dealing, they're already beyond that, though. And they're on to like C++ with like static analysis suites, like a lot of places that are, you know, doing industrial C++. And also, you know, I mean, there's no C++ defenders here, you know, so we can we can kick them while they're down. But, um, you know, C, the C language itself has come a lot of, a well, long ways in terms we're, we're of We're still being recorded. If, if you want me to stop the recording... <laughs> then we yeah can... no i mean I, I would say the c language itself and i think that you know they really are trying to iterate on it um to to make it more durable but i mean that might just be about the longevity of existing code bases um but if you ask a lot of really experienced c plus people um they really they're they're like big mad about rust because a lot of it is you know the way that the compiler you know ties their hands and kind of discourages certain approaches so i think that it'll be a while and that you know a certain generation will just have to move on but that a new generation who would normally turn to see and this is already happening i mean you know aws you know they're you know in the process basically of you know standing up like you can see it with firecracker if you're familiar with that um kind of like you know an alternative like thinner leaner you know virtualization infrastructure running on something less than a full operating system but still a fully virtualized machine and you know they're when they're starting for those you know basically new architectures from the ground up the language that you know organizations are turning to again and again and again for high throughput critical you know use stuff is always going to be it, it seems to be rust that's why and i mentioned it back on the previous slide when you know during the pandemic you know mozilla laid off a quarter of their workforce and including most of the rust team and at that time you know they went and they formed a foundation and the you know founding members who was it it was amazon it was google it was microsoft you know and since then a whole bunch of other companies have joined because i mean the the value proposition is out there and you know right now that value proposition is basically like large distributed consensus systems you know things that are you know way past c10k um stuff like that you know i mean so there's a niche for it so I, I was going to just jump in because uh, you, you brought up something. I actually work with a couple of C++ developers in sort of the CAD side of things of, of my company. Um, and man, I would love it if they could use Rust. Uh, is it, do you know if uh, Rust is trying to move into like the sort of the CAD market or 
uh, you know, um, sort of the I mean, linear algebra processing kind of visual. Uh, I mean, the math libraries are all there in terms of like, there's nothing like, I forget the name of the one big Fortran library. There's nothing that good. But that being said, Rust can directly consume those because Rust, can, Rust has a clean CFFI. So, you know, you can you can consume all of those big C math libraries if you need to. Um, but also yeah, there's- Everyone does. Yeah. <laughs> Python, there's a, Python and C and, and everything. Yeah, no, there's a fight to four trade people though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really quick, I was going to say though, Chris, is that if what you're doing is building, if you have to, in order to extend your for your CAD practice to extend it, if you have to ship C++ libraries basically, or you know C++ uh, bins, then what there is is there is a library and project within Rust, um, within the Rust community called CXX, all, mm -hmm. all caps. And what and what CXX is because what Rust provides is the C ABI and C FFI and so they have a library. There's an official or not an official, but a, a pretty blessed library um, that does the C plus plus side because you know like C plus plus itself doesn't have a stable ABI at the at the platform level. So like you know it's all down to individual implementations, and so they do most of the work um, for that. So I believe that if you know it is you know if you wanted to say hey if you guys you know wanted to use Rust to ship these kinds of libraries, you know, to put put a shim around it so it could be invoked and consumed by a C++ program, I think that the path is there. But of course, you know, most of your hurdles to that are going to be uh, bureaucratic and institutional. Yeah, and, and personnel. I mean, you know, they, they know C++, they're not going to, but I, I would, I mean, I'd feel so much better if, uh, if they could use, if they could use Rust. That's, that's me. <laughs> yeah, it's so you, David. I do love the language. I think it's a great language. So yeah. Thumbs up. So you touched a little bit on uh, Rust in the JavaScript space as far as the back end stuff. Um, do you see a future in the front end, like the WSL? For yes. Like yes. Um, I forgot to mention, I actually had a note, but I blew past it um, to talk about Rust and WASM. So, um, you know, there is, there is, you know, really um, uh, pretty good tooling. Um, both uh, LLVM has a WASM target, and then um, also Rust has an experimental backend called CraneLift that was actually written um, as an extension to TraceMonkey, which is kind of like you know Mozilla's most recent iteration of their JavaScript engine, what's called ScriptMonkey. Um, and so uh, CraneLift is kind of meant to be like a modular extension to that, which they're using to do all of their WASM interpretation. And so incidentally, what they also have is like, you know, in the process of building a thing that can do like live JIT um, of that is you basically get a machine code interpreter in WASM format. So there, there's a, you can basically run Rust-C and then have it spit out WASM and that's there. Um, and there's, you know, there, there's pretty good shims and tools there like people are able to you know do like 3d games in various platforms and then ship them uh, on the on the client and stuff like that and uh, it's that that's another really strong space for it of course you know because that's i mean what wasm is making possible is basically to have you know really tight compilers without gc to spit out you know interpreted code that can just run you know and so so it'll it'll definitely have a space there for you know high performance front end uh, applications um, and Backend as well. Uh, I've, I was recently um, listening to an interview with uh, Martin Kleppman, the guy who's writing the um, auto merge. And one of the things they're talking about doing is rewriting auto merge in Rust. So, because it's got that WASM backend, and that, that, make, 